sitting inside. Interesting. So, um, how many people had general problems with running other people's stuff? That worked just fine. They got, uh, both of them had it uh, running. One of them had one thing that wasn't completely, and that was fine. Everything works. So. Good. So, because one, one thing we probably should have asked to specify was uh, API version of the uh, virtual, uh, of the emulator that has it has been developed on, right? Because that is a classic uh, on getting things wrong. So, it may be worthwhile to for the next lab that we are kind of super clear. Which um, API versions are you usually working on? 26, because my phone 26. Can yeah, cool. 28, 28, 28, okay. The rest? And your phone support that? Yeah. So, who, you guys, which APIs usually? 28, okay, one, someone on 28. Marshmallow. Marshmallow, two, yeah, so that is 24 or something, right? Yeah, I run that on. There is like one thing with the mobile. I saw that I like comment out in one line. I kind of destroyed my entire preference thing. So I like one line commented out and then now nothing works. If I just remove the comments, everything works, which is a bit annoying. It's like, you know, lose an entire. Thing on. Yeah, I had something similar. I pushed it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that happens. That between APIs easily, right? Yeah. So, so but but uh, one of the things that we got already, what we figured out based on informal feedback, which is novel because we made one mistake. We are too transparent. We actually give you the actual feedback for review, which is uh, in, not in our uh, best interest, <laughs> because of course you you object to some of uh, aspects. So which motivates. Us, uh, so of course that's, I mean, that not uh, serious, but uh, motivates us to have some sort of notification system. So you have a basic way of interacting between the reviewers and the reviewee, even though you don't know each other. So, but just, uh, hey, can you check that again? Because I think your comment is a bit off. And of course, allow adjustment of review subsequently. So, so, so is that already working? No, no. Okay. That will be next iteration because right now there's not even the capability to rev revisit your review. Yeah, we'll do that as well. That's, I that's, that's yeah. Lot, yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we actually looked at most of the comments already and put them already in the next cycle. So we, they're either issues or not. Some of them are, you know, icing on the cake, but some are more general, like as being able to re-edit the reviews before deadline, which is inherently sensible. Uh, and also after deadline, actually, uh, similar for submission. So a lot of that kind of nitty gritty stuff will be done. That's why I just mentioned to you what, when the submission for the third assignment or lab will happen. And that will only happen after the after the review cycle has ended for the next labs because then we can redeploy the complete system with all fixes and all adjustments and new features and so on. Also we have like semi fixed states in a way, right? So because uh, some of the suggestions, of course, uh, require um, uh, adjustments to the underlying database schema as well. So it's a lot cleaner if we do that from scratch again. Also, we have realized we need to collect slightly more user data in terms of your, your names accordingly because we don't enforce necessarily proper naming. So some of you still use some acronyms or whatever else, but we need your proper student name so we can associate your uh, 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 reviews slash submissions with your actual mark in the end, as opposed to us doing probabilistic matching of uh, uh, usernames against the real names, right? So um, that's something we need to work on as well. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff um, that, that will be in the refined version as well. Um, so on the manage, management side of things. Um, but any, any feedback that you typed into the feedback form uh, will at least be considered. Uh, not necessarily all be integrated because some of this is a bit too luxurious, but um, but some aspects which are really insightful, uh, we're still contemplating whether and how to do it. Like, for example, include screenshots into the system. But we're kind of slightly worried that we get too many blobs and then the database yep. will just explode. So we're thinking about providing a standard mechanism of li linking pictures externally, right? So you can host them on an external service and just provide the link and embed it somehow. So that's, an, that's another path where you're currently thinking about. So we kind of, you see, in many cases, we have this compromise of convenience on the one hand, and of course, documentation. Uh, as well as manageability on our side, because we want to use that across a lot of different courses, not only mobile, but also cloud, of course, and also in master's courses, which don't have any coding per se, but use it for other purposes. Mm -hmm. So it should be a very generic tool. But in case, any case, any feedback is desirable, any bug or feature, please make uh, create issues. Uh, um, bring them up also after uh, the closed cycle of the review. Perhaps you notice something then. Um, in, in any case, most of the issues that have been put in the feedback form are at least noted and um, um, are going to be at least considered and likely addressed. Um, and then we go from there. Um, especially there are some quite some demands for uh, revisiting the reviews, right? So we probably have a session where 
we say, okay, who has issues with the reviews? Uh, and then we kind of probably link you guys for, for once in an ad hoc fashion. So we allow you to adjust and we can do some post uh, review of the or adjustment of the reviews accordingly, perhaps. Uh, but for the next iteration, hopefully you have the interaction system so you can uh, solve that at runtime. So that also makes more sense to give you a bit more review time because the giving you the entire week is a bit, bit long. And in fact, we would, for uh, in, 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 in our own to, to wrap this up quite early, encourage anyone who hasn't done their review yet to do it soon and quick, well before the deadline, because if we have all the reviews, we can close the system, right? So there's no inherent mark attached to doing the reviews, so it shouldn't take you really long, because I saw a few people really doing it in within you know half an hour or something like this after opening the system, pretty impressive. And if the earlier you wrap up, the earlier you get the new system for playing around with this, and the more time you'll have for review, simple as that, right? So um, that's it from the review, from the submission system side. Any comments from your side? So at, at the moment, they have to use issue tracker if they want to point something. Yes. So it's ideally, because that makes it easier for us to follow up, right? You could post on Discord, but it's less likely that we actually spot this. Uh, issue tracker makes it a lot of lot easier. And if they want to communicate them. with the um, person responsible for the submission, they don't have the option at the moment. They don't have the option of the moment. No, we never had the option in the previous. Is there some period. identifier or something that they could use through the issue tracker or not? If they want to communicate with the other person, yeah, uh, not per se, no. Okay. So right now the idea would be more along the line that we match them where necessary. Okay. Right. So because it's not so it's mediated through us through the issue tracker yes, potentially. Yes, that would be a sensible yeah. okay. pathway that we do a one to one kind of uh, okay. thing more explicitly. Yeah. Um, because how many people have spotted issues with the reviews they have received? One, two, three, four. That's no, not too bad. Some of them, yeah, okay. Yeah. You don't have, no one has uh, reviewed mine yet, you said. I haven't checked it the review days. So. Yes. So no, I don't think, uh, again, there's not all reviews out yet. So we are probably to match those uh, specific ones then. So um, lucky in my case, though, since I had that uh, bug I hadn't fixed. So there's, no, that is after the deadline, so I should get some minus so, that. You should, technically. So we, 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 we do weren't lenient on this one as well. So for example, we don't explicitly say, please check the commit date, <laughs> the latest commit. But it would be sensible because we, you know, you're posting URLs. So it would be sensible to, to, to test whether people actually submitted before the actual actual deadline as opposed to the submission uh, deadline, which was uh, belated. Can that be manipulated? Sorry? The commit date. That can be manipulated. Okay, if you that ambitious and trying to cheat and game the system, and the other the reviewer doesn't figure it out, then you probably deserve the mark as well. <laughs> so uh, then I wouldn't be terribly worried. But it's more like a common sense approach, right? So if you, uh, in fact, we wouldn't be terribly worried because the the offset was was not too 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 long, was like yeah. two days or whatever. I mean, that wouldn't make a big difference, uh, I guess. Anyway, again, bear in mind that the labs. Yes, they are marked, and they are they have significant impact on your on your on your overall uh, uh, mark uh, accumulated, but only in conjunction with the project, and that's something that's explicitly marked and reviewed by yeah. us anyway. So um, I wouldn't be terribly worried. The labs are, in our experience, never a maker or breaker. It's always the project that decides yeah. how how things pan out with you, because if you don't do the labs well, you will not succeed well in the project. Um, so they're kind of uh, the project is kind of a. a, a Symptomatic about your performance in labs. Yeah. No, the project. Yeah. Um, ah, yeah, project. Yes. Yeah, the project. Um, <laughs> was to talk about with my group, and someone thought about making a mobile game in Unity. That would that be considered mobile development? No. We had it in the past, and uh, the thing was just it was Unity development. In the end, because it was just a matter of which platform do you want to compile it down to, right? Yeah. So. It, it, it doesn't you probably make an argument that you really kind of have to think about the user interface now. User interface. Yeah, so if, if your game has to be played on the mobile and it uses like uh, mobile sensors for something, like if you mm -hmm. really make it kind of a mobile experience, then I would say sure. Because I would like, in order to just like, I don't have to like, you know, have the world touch input. Like, like, touch input is not enough. And um, yeah, maybe I use some sensors that. Like it has to be impossible to play it on a laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah, like if lap on laptop you cannot play it, then that means it's probably mobile enough. <laughs> Not even emulator. Um, yeah, emulator is okay. Okay, compromise. Yeah. <laughs>
but touch i mean you do have um a mouse and, and so on right unless you do like multi point gestures yeah so yeah if you if you want to go this path th there is some gray area yes you you can technically do it if you want to port an existing c++ game or some opengl software that you have onto mobile that's okay uh, because you will be exposed to nitty gritty of the mobile platform Unity shielded, shields you, right? So in Unity, you may not know anything about mobile development and still make a game. Um, and, and we want to prevent that. Yeah. But if you will have a good case for the mobile Unity game, uh, yeah, we can consider it. Yeah. It's really about you pitching the projects to some extent as well, right? Because you think about it as a fully fetched product, or at least a solid prototype. Yeah. So, uh, you know, sell us the idea of it, right? So. Our group, or my group, is going to speak with those uh, people yep. from uh, what was that project called? Uh, yeah, the, the Self App. I, I don't. Yeah, Self App. Uh, we're together also. Yeah, I saw yeah. Anyway, that we're going to talk with them on the Friday at nine o'clock. Sounds good. Yeah, um, and sure, you know, we don't have incredibly amount of time left, so it's really important to be productive quickly. So if you, you know, were quickly after that being able to actually work on your concept and then the implementation, then I'm, I'm would. Not be worried, but just be in mind their, their scope may be larger than what we have in mind, right? So we just think about probably you know talk and then see how we scope how many it. Weeks do we have uh, basically? When is the submission deadline? Um, we should know that. Hang on. I I think it is fifth of May. I That's think it's the last day of into this wiki thing. Yeah, uh, it's written there most likely. Yeah. So uh, usually, check. yeah, usually it's last day of lectures. Uh, like um, that is um, yeah beginning of May usually. So we have. Four-ish weeks. Graphics exam date starts. Um, slightly off topic, um, I believe. Um, what is it? I think ninth of October. Um, not October. The other one, uh, May. <laughs> You're in October already. <laughs> well, it's it's you know symmetric in a sense. Yeah, yeah let's already. check wiki. Third? No, no, no. Let's hit now. Uh, second. Yeah, so we have presentations on project submission deadline 2nd of May. That is a Tierstag, Tuesday, right? Or Wednesday? Thursday. Because we have uh, presentations on Thursday. So Thursday before is the submission deadline. Yes, right. Okay. So that's good. Then you're done by then. So that's, that's very sensible. When is the graphic exam? Immediately after it. Okay, then. Perfect. Timing. So let's put it slightly later. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's great. And then uh, while working the mobile thing, you also have to make some skeleton of a thing for the. Uh, well, no, no, no. That, that, that's not the point. The, the point yeah, is the written the exam is really late. What you're doing it. That's why you have a second assignment in graphics. That's the time where you think about the framework, right? And after submission, you can need to ex you know generalize some elements of it. But fundamentally, that shouldn't be far from what you can use in the exam, right? So. Yeah, fair enough. We do have lighting and so on in it already. So if we add a skeleton, then we're going to be able to use that. And it's, uh, I don't have a skeleton, but we do have like four different kinds of lights. Because that guy we have, he uh, is really good with lighting. Uh, we do have a sync rat. And we do render the car. And now I've started rendering the notes that yeah. move towards it. It's just, I try to make uh, an array of pointers so that I could have a dynamic number of notes. And but those values could then not uh, even refer to the values within themselves anymore when it was a pointer. I don't know why. Uh, I have literally no clue. I get the access violation and it makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I will try to fix it when I, my brain is actually functional, you know, not today. Because I try today and then I get so we, we will provide some uh, project uh, examples as well. We haven't done it yet, but we will post um, projects on the on the wiki. So there were a couple of things mentioned. Shh. So one uh, was the scene graph. Um, so I want to point you to um, some resources that you can start investigating yourself now. So one we already mentioned is OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV is a very fun library for computer vision, and it works on Android quite seamlessly. Uh, it, it used to be quite a hassle to uh, to use it on Android, but now you have lots of tutorials and uh, and it works quite well. 
So the second one is called Air Core. So um, if you go to Google uh, developers.google.com slash AR, it will point you to resources that you can use for playing with the augmented reality. Augmented reality is also quite fun. Um, you can have uh, a tracker placed on your table, and then you can do some uh, rendering of some images, uh, some three D objects, on, you know, based on the location in the real world. Um, so it's a fun technology to to play with. We will have some um, some uh, lectures on it um, from Richard. He will mostly talk uh, Unity integration. Uh, but you can play with um, with Java integration with the libraries that are there uh, and see some of the examples and see some of the things that you can kind of run with the sample project and how you can extend it. Um, so th there is um, uh, there are some um, projects and so so that's the second technology. So the the framework for uh, doing the tracking of augmented reality is called augmented reality core, AI, AR core. Um, the framework which allows you to render three-dimensional objects on the scene without knowing OpenGL is called SceneForm. Uh, so SceneForm is a kind of a set of libraries which allow you to render uh, three-dimensional objects on the scene. Uh, and you can use it for augmented reality or you can use it for a 3D interface if you want as well. Um, so they have some uh, guides and they have some initial projects and how to how to do that um, on developers um, documentation. So those are two fun technologies which you can consider learning a little bit more for the project or using the project to learn more about. If you um, if you want to learn more about 3D graphics, about uh, rendering, about um, augmented reality, then those are you know um, fun things to try. OpenCV is another one. Um, we will post some projects, uh, proposals. Some might involve some of those technologies. Uh, and uh, we will also have some projects which relate to the native development. So that's what we covered last week. Um, and what I will do today is I will kind of show you how the pipeline works like and how you do the kind of a native development or native integration with the underlying native layer. Uh, there is a um, hidden motive <laughs> for for this. Um, so we actually talk with Christopher, uh, and there is um, some of you are second year, some of you are kind of finishing this semester. Uh, but those of you who are not finishing this semester and will be working with us next year and planning your bachelor thesis, there is a very nice um, project that you could potentially do um, for the integration that I will discuss today. So before I dive into the details, I will kind of show you uh, what it what is involved in kind of a compiling native code with um, with Java and with Android project. And then uh, we will briefly discuss what is this project that you could get yourself involved in. Um, so um, let's start with something simple. Um, so what we will do is, yeah, uh, is there, there is no stream I'm recording. So I will put it after the lecture. So unfortunately, I couldn't get the stream going on time. So it's faster if I just record and then post it. <clears throat> um, so apologies for all the streaming students who are waiting. It will come, but with a delay. Um, so what we will do is uh, we will have um, a simple use case. Um, so let me just draw it quickly. So what we will do is we need something on the on the native layer. So we could use C++. We could go other languages. We could use Go. Um, for the brevity and for the tool chain, I will use Go because it's kind of the, um, the easiest to demonstrate. Um, then we will have kind of an intermediary layer, which interacts, which allows us to interact with the native layer. And then we will have our application. 
uh, and our application will be in Java, um, the normal Android stack, which will do something uh, and the calls will be kind of uh, managed by the um, native layer, right? So we have to implement something here. We have to deal with all the uh, middle part to make it actually work. And then we have to use it from within our application. Because we're using Go, it, it is a little bit simpler to demonstrate the concepts. The concepts with any other programming language like C++ works almost exactly the same. The middle layer is slightly different and slightly differently managed, right? So this middle layer for Go is what we will discuss today. If you were to repeat the whole exercise and use C++, um, that part will be slightly different and this part will be slightly different. And obviously the implementation is different because you're using C++, right? Uh, so it's not that the concepts and the pipeline is exactly the same, but the details are slightly different. So what we will do is we will do two things. First, I will do a very simple one. Um, so our first use case is we will implement some really simple, uh, simple function uh, that does something here, and then we will use it from Java. Okay, that's like the, the typical hello world use case that, that you will get. The second one, uh, and I hope we can get it done in like in 20 minutes, okay? Um, the second one is a little bit more involved. What we will do is we will um, use third party library, right? You found something that somebody implemented in the native layer and you want to use it on Android, right? So you found a kind of an interesting library or something that you want to use. And then what is the process of getting this third party library to be able to be used from within Java, from within your Android project, right? Um, so this one is a little bit more involved, but this one is more interesting uh, because that involves, you know, fiddling with the middle part a little bit more. So let's do the first one th first. Um, let's do this very simple hello world. Those of you who don't know Go, it doesn't really matter um, because what is interesting is the, the middle part and the upper part. The implementation details of using somebody's library, somebody already implemented it. You're not, you're not implementing it, right? You just want to use it, right? So for like we're doing the first part only to kind of a bootstrap, what we are really interested is this, because you found something native and you want to use it in Android, how you can do that, right? You are not implementing it. So if, if this is implemented in a programming language, you don't really know, it doesn't matter, like you're not dealing with the implementation details, right? Um, so let's uh, let's have a look uh, what what we need to do. Um, so um, I will create a folder. Um, so uh, what we will call it uh, native. Um, yeah, let's call it native demo. I already have a native demo. So let's see what's inside. It's my Android project, so let's go back. Let's remove it because I've been already playing with it. To um, all right, so we do it again. So what we need is we need two components. So first we need this kind of a native implementation of some sort, and then we need the Android project which will use it. So I will create a, a very simple um, Go program. So let's um, call, yep. So let's call it native. Yeah, uh, it's too much typing. Let's call it demo. Um, and I will edit this. So what we will do is we will have a very simple um, source code. So um, so we will have main just to test that. Uh, our function works, 
and we need some sort of function that we want to use from Java, right? So let's uh, call it um, demo from Go. And this function, for simplicity, doesn't take any parameters and returns us a string, right? So let's say this function returns us a string and it says return um, my name. Um, okay, and we need to have a package. Yeah, so we call it native demo. We have this function and then we will say format print um, and we call demo All right, so if I go back here and I say go build demo go, it builds my application. And if I say go run demo go, um, yeah, so I cannot run it because it's not the main package, but it's okay. I can only have main inside the main package, right? Uh, I'm kind of pretending I have a library, so I don't want to rename it to main to have a main, I just want to pretend it's a library, right? But if I call this, it would print my name, right? If it actually executed. Do you believe me? So we leave it, we leave it at this, right? I have a code in Go, which I can compile, so it doesn't have any errors. And it has a single method, which returns a string, as simple as it can get, right? So what we need now is we need an Android Studio, and we need a project. So it will come. So as I said, this typically somebody else has implemented. We will use a larger example in a minute. Um, so you're not really writing this. Uh, what you're doing is, yeah, so I just deleted that one. So we'll do start a new project. We will use empty activity. We'll do next, we will call it native demo. We will call it native Java demo because I call the other one native demo. Uh, and we will put it into this folder, language Java. Yeah, we kind of keep it as it is. Um, all right, so now I have a project and I would like to use the method that I have in Go uh, from Java. So, I go to yes, and we need to make this bigger. Yeah, so, I have my uh, main class, and now I kind of I would like to call this native method, but I can't, right? There is no easy way for me to call it. So I need this middle part. This middle part which converts what the native layer does to what Java does. So how I get there? Well, with um, C++ there is a similar toolchain. With Rust there is a similar toolchain. With, um, with Go uh, there is a package which is called Go Mobile. So I will, I have already pre-installed it. So if I go, uh, go so if you go to mobile Golang, it's, the link is in the slides um, from the wiki. Uh, you will see that it tells you to um, install Go Mobile. So you, you say go get, right? Um, you execute this command 
and it will install a Go module for you. You have to have Go installed on your on your computer as well. So you have to have Go installed, and then by running this Go command, you will have Go Mobile installed. Um, so once you have Go Mobile installed, um, you run a command which um, specifies what you want to um, uh, build for um, interfacing between the world of Go with the world of Java. Uh, Go, those of you who are not familiar with Go, is using uh, a, a kind of a packaging system which uses your local file storage for having a different packages that to what you have. Um, so what I've done so far is I've created uh, a folder in my um, home directory and in that folder I have one file called demo go but to follow the go conventions I have to move it to the place where um, where go expects it to be so I will kill my visual studio code I will go so I will go do cd go path and go path is kind of the root for all the go projects and then you have source and then I have something called Marius local. So I will go there and I will move my um, projects. Oops, I'm sorry. Projects uni native demo to here and I will call it um, native demo. So now if I go to native demo, I have the same file that I had before. Um, and I can execute this go mobile thing. So the, you say go mobile bind the target Android. I'm targeting Android. I could com cross compile it to iOS as well. Um, I'm specifying that I want to do it for Android. And I'm specifying the package that I want to compile. If I run this command in this folder, um, uh, that's okay. But I will go. I will go to my um, projects uni. Oops. Native Java demo. So that's my Android project, right? So you can do it anywhere. I, I just want to have everything in one place, so I can remove it later. <laughs> so I will call go mobile. And I have my uh, Marius underscore local, and then I called it a uh, native um, native demo. So what happens now? Go mobile takes this source file and all the other related files. It finds um, uh, Yes, it finds the related package and then creates a binary and a jar file which will be used for me to talk to it from Java. It failed because I think I have, um, I think I messed up the naming conventions, so I have to do go path source uh, Marius local um, so let's oops um, yeah how we should call it demo uh, let's rename Yeah, yeah. Let's try with capital native demo. So if I go to native demo and I rename it to go path source Arius native demo, I will rename my uh, folder to match the package. So it's similar like in Java, the packages have to match the um, yeah. 
native demo. Yeah, it complains. So what's the pro problem? Oh uh, yeah. So uh, in Go, um, so if I go back to my file, native demo. And go everything that is exported uh, has to start with capital letter. All the things which are small letters are private. So this module, this library, didn't have anything that the Go mobile could export because I have only private things. So it says, yeah, you know, you can compile it, but you know, it's, there is no point because nobody can use it. So if I modify it to cap um, and rerun it, fingers crossed. So it takes a while. For a very trivial problem program, it still takes a while. It takes ages, so we will do the next one, the next step in the break, <laughs> um, because the other one takes even longer. Um, the good thing is um, there is no manual steps. All the steps are embedded in the Go Mobile, and the Go Mobile takes all the steps and does everything automatically, right? So there is like a tool chain which does several things. So what needs to happen? Um, First thing that needs to happen is I need to have some. Um, um, so the first thing is a public API needs to be generated. So what is exported? What can be accessed from outside? Right. That's what the first error was that there was no ability to generate the public API because nothing was public. Right. So this needs to be ex ex extracted, and you will have a method signatures or function signatures which are public API to the native module. Then, uh, based on those public API, a conversion needs to happen from the original language, which is, for uh, in our case, Go, to a language which Java can understand. So in our case, it will be C, right? So from Go, we go to C. It generates kind of a method signatures. And then it needs to generate a Java native interface which links those C functions, which then point to the native library to the JNI layer, right? That's what we saw last week with the C++ thing. And then the fourth thing is it needs to match those things to the native implementation. And then it needs to generate a public API uh, for my access, right? Um, and I want this to be in Java, right? In C, when, when I showed you last week the C++ code, we stopped at that point and those methods were uh, already linked with native keyword and with the method available in the Java world. They were basically were saying, I want a native library and I want to call this method in the library, right? So you can stop at this point and call the native library methods directly or you can have an intermediary, intermediate layer, which is in Java. And that's what this process does. So it follows those four steps and ends up with this module and with the uh, binary file, which is this compiled, which then can be accessed through JNI and C back to the actual machine code, right? Um, so it, it finished. Um, the um, sorry, the compiler finished, and now what we have, if I list, um, so let me clear that. What we have here is two extra files. I have native demo dash sources and native demo dot aar. This is the binary. This is the binary which represents uh, the actual native logic from the Go program. And the jar file is a jar file, right? We can have a look what's inside the jar file. So if I um, open uh, the jar file and I look inside, I see that it has two folders. One is called Go, 
and it has some JNI uh, layer which is generated. So I can have a look inside. And it says, oh yeah, instantiate the logger, uh, load the library. You remember the code load library from the C++? We had to do this before we could run the native calls, right? So you see that it, it's doing it for us. It's actually calling load library for us. Um, it loads the Go JNI library. And then it specifies um, some of the things that are for passing the global context into the Go. Uh, layer, right? So there is a little bit of um, uh, house um, house cleaning, uh, and then we again have a logger. We have some uh, some calls referring to the context uh, and some internal things for proxy for going between the Go objects and Java objects and so on. It's not kind of interesting for us. Um, so if we go into the native demo, we see that we have just one file and it's the native demo package which gives us a demo from Go function call. Remember I have one function which is called demo from Go which returns a string and it is a native function, right? So here I have it inside a native demo module and I can call it. So um, it, when we did the C++ example, we have basically the same. We had load library, and then we declared a native method in the class, and then we could call it. It was an instance method. Here it is a static method on this module, right? So there are similarities, small variations. And all of this was generated by Go Mobile directly, right? So now what I can do is I can go back to my, um, to my project and I need to import, so I have to go and say um, um, import module and I have to find it, which is kind of inside the um, inside my projects, oops Projects uni native demo native Java demo and then I do include this uh, jar file. So once I include this jar file, um, I uni I come on native demo. Sources. It doesn't allow me to do that. So let's do um, native demo. Yeah, let's do it again. Something is not quite right with my. Um, so if I do. Yeah, I actually have to say new module. So I have to say new module be, be, uh, instead of importing because Android Studio can only import existing projects and modules. Like I don't actually have a module yet. I will create a new module. So you say uh, it's a new jar slash AAR package, right? So you're creating a new module by selecting from a new module menu this import dot jar or dot AAR. Um, and then you go next, then you select where it is. Um, so they are here. So I select the jar file. Um, don't remove the original file and finish. And then if I go, yeah, it will do its magic. So after the process is done, what should I be able to do is I should be able to import native demo. Right, and I should be able to call uh, a method from the native demo. Right, uh, currently I cannot do that, so I should be able to to call uh, native demo dot um, what was it demo from go. 
I should be able to do that. Um, I cannot do that. We need one more step. And this one more step is we go to uh, project structure. And we say that the project um, that the app has dependency and we have a dependency on the module which I just created which is called native demo sources so if I do that and I click OK again it will redo the, the magic And hopefully that should end up with me being able to resolve this. I still cannot resolve this. Um, so let me see. Yeah, it should be called native demo. So let's do one more. So if I say new module. I pick the AR file next and I pick AR this time and it's called native demo I will say yes and I go back to the project structure for the app uh, dependencies I need to add module dependency, which is native demo. All right, so now it has to work. Yeah, it complains. What if I build it? Let me see, make the project. So what we did was we implemented a very simple library. We generated all the dependent um, structures using Go Mobile. Uh, we included the two modules into our project which are jar slash AAR modules. Um, and now we're trying to put it all together. And we... Um, we are missing... Yeah. So, yeah. That's the problem was. So, it's called native demo class inside the native demo package, right? Yeah. So I I, met, I kind of missed the second part of the um, of the name. So now if I build this, um, I can rebuild this and it will compile and you basically can call this function from Go, which we have, which returns a string. So I can have um, I can say string s equals and it will give me that string, right? Was it hard? No, it wasn't that hard, right? It was a little bit fiddly. You have to know what to do in which order, uh, and you need to import then the two modules into your project and then use it, right? Um, so that part was quite straightforward. The Go Mobile took all the magic and all the problems uh, from you. Uh, and you went through all those pipelines, and now from Java, I can call Go functions, right? So in theory, I can go into my uh, Go code um, and uh, change it and have, um, yeah. So if I bigger, so if I go to uh, Go, native demo and now I ca I could potentially modify um, I could modify this um, go source code to change the behavior of the method 
recompile it, regenerate the AAR file, uh, and then I can have some logic done in Go, right? If I want to call, um, like, I want to do some um, hashing or some use some crypto library from Go, I can do that, right? I can give it uh, a string parameter, so I can say uh, parameter um, p is a string, and then use p inside the method and return something, right? So for simple things, I have a kind of a skeleton and it will work quite well, okay? So what we will do is I will um, show you a library. Uh, I've used as an example, there is a um, library called libp2p. It's a co quite complex library allowing you to do a number of things with peer-to-peer -peer networking, with peer-to-peer -peer computing. Um, so it's a modular stack written uh, in a uh, number of implementations. Uh, so if you go to implementations, you will see that they have uh, a number of... Um, so they have a discovery protocol for discovering nodes. They have a trans different transport layers. They have a peer routing. So you can, for example, do a messaging app, which routes messages peer-to-peer -peer fashion without a central server. So you can have a peer-to-peer -peer messaging app, right? Easily done with this library. Uh, if you were to implement it in Java, you would kind of, uh, you know, kill yourself to implementing all the layers which are already implemented here. Uh, now in Java, you can just do the UI and kind of the user interface for doing the messaging. And on the underlying layer is done through this comprehensive library, right? Um, you have crypto channels, so you can uh, make this messaging app using crypto channels to make it secure, and so on and so forth. They, it is very big, right? Um, the thing is, it's so big that it probably takes like 15 minutes to compile it. So I will um, have a break now, and I will <laughs> compile the AR file before we do the, the other module, right? Um, so let's have a break, and we come back and kind of finish this. I was thinking about making a driving assistant. Um, yeah. Um, basically, a simple D DPS service, uh, simple speed monitoring, some basic. Yeah. Yeah. For more advanced features, I want to do monitor the road for uh, people walking in the road and animals walking in. With camera? Yeah. Or what? Yeah, okay. Um, I would also like to have a back end traffic monitoring service so I can report on uh, events going on. Okay. Uh, for how many people? In your group, uh, three. three people in the group. Yeah, yeah. and we spend remaining time doing testing. Yeah, and you're planning to use OpenCV for the detection of objects and so on. Yeah. Um, this is realistic. That's a web extend, right? How polished was it? I would say the the vision part is on the ambitious side. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite hard to do kind of the object detection. Um, from a running car, mm. right? Um, what is it capable of seeing? Yeah, so... Um, I mean, yeah. my app can spot the faces. My camera can yeah. see faces instantly. So That's right. So that part is easy, yeah. okay? Uh, that part is easy. Uh, the part which is hard is you have, you have your scene. Uh, if your phone... If your phone is in your hands mm -hmm. and you're scanning the scene, right? Uh, you 
Like everything on the scene moves, right? Everything moves because you move the phone, right? So detecting the movement because of the movement of the phone, same as you're driving. So when you're driving, it's like everything is, will be moving because you're driving, right? This, this one is called flow. And the flow analysis allows you to extract from the scene everything that is moving because you're moving, not because it is moving, right? And now what you need to detect is the movement. So if there is a person which actually walks, right? The person is moving while you're moving. So you have to kind of uh, remove the background, which is static, uh, from a moving car and detect moving objects, right? Uh, so uh, moving objects. So that part is it's doable, but it's not that trivial. It's, uh, detecting faces is more trivial than this, right? So this is a little bit more on the ambitious side. So if you're driving and there is something else that moves on the road and you want to detect it, uh, you have to use that. You have to extract all the background, which is static, and focus on the elements which are also moving against the background, right? Um, so that's one aspect. The second aspect is you could have static objects which are on the road. Yeah. Right. So if there is something which is on the road but it's not moving, then the flow will remove it because it's a part of the background. But you want to detect it because let's say there is a truck parked in front of, of you on the intersection on the road, right? Uh, you want to detect it that it's kind of in front of you, right? That it's a truck in front of you. Uh, and that bit is kind of tricky because from the static image, you have to understand all the pixels and understand what is the road and what it means to be on top of the road, what it means to be on the road, right? Uh, and that part is even harder than this part. <laughs> yeah. So you will have some challenges. I think this one is doable. Like if you want to have a camera see through, which basically highlights moving things. I think you can do that relatively easily with OpenCV. Uh, if you want to do something with it, yeah, it's more work. But I think you can do that. Detecting something static on the road from a moving car, yeah, I, I think that might be too hard uh, for the project. Yeah. So you can detect moving people and uh, moving cars. Um, that that should be doable. Uh, yeah, from uh, from OpenCV. But yeah, sure. Uh, I think doing the speed, uh, doing the uh, GPS kind of uh, some of the GPS tracking, that, that's straightforward, easy. Uh, we had last time, uh, not last time, but we had in the past, we had uh, an app which students developed, which was detecting how nervously you drive. So like how rapidly you accelerate and how rapidly you decelerate to kind of give you a rating of how smooth driver are you, right? Uh, so it was kind of like a s simple game which make you kind of drive uh, smoothly instead of being kind of aggressive. So it gave you kind of a rating of how aggressive driver are you, right? Of course you can misuse it to be like the most aggressive driving you can do, right? Uh, <laughs> but you could use accelerometer for that as well. So you could have, if you have three people, you know, one person can do GPS and accelerometer, and two can work on the vision uh, libraries or how to integrate it. So yeah, I would say, yeah, go for it. Um, the non-vision things will be easy. The vision part will be a bit more work. Yeah. And look into the flow, uh, flow background extraction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Trump, to jest no wiecie? Bad idea. Yes, it was. In general, working with assets and not thinking through what you're doing is a bad idea. That is basis. That if they are like, when it comes to exactly what they do to a human, it's basically the same thing. Although if they are, of course, like, 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 I think a break. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So let's get back to the example. Um, we have the libp2p library, and we found it, and we go into the implementation, and it says it's in Rust, in Go, in JavaScript, in Python, but it's not on, on Java and Android, right? If it was in Java, we could use it natively from Java, but it's not, right? So we look at the list. We're not going to use Python. Um, we could use JavaScript if we were doing web app and kind of run it in the browser. Um, but we want to kind of have a native uh, implementation, so we're going to use this, right? So if I go here, I see the, the library. And then with Go, what you do is you... Um, um, they kind of tell you how to use it, how to import it. And then you're using the Go package manager to load the sources in for yourself, right? So now you have two two options. You kind of really have one option, but you, you think you have two options. So one option is I can compile the entire library and have everything that the library makes public available to me from Android. And then I will just use the library, right? So that feels like a good option. And that feels kind of natural uh, for us to, uh, to try. So you have you have this uh, native layer. Um, it's it's a it's a library, right? It's a lib, which has kind of a, a lot of uh, public um, publicly exposed API, right? And you you may think to yourself, yeah, great. So I'm I'm gonna compile it and all of it, 
uh, and expose all this public API to myself into the Java world, uh, and then build my app uh, directly here, right? Um, it has multiple problems. The first problem is that you will not know exactly how all the public methods which are described and, and used in, in Go converted to those Java methods, right? With the simple method which we had, which was uh, demo go return string, it was kind of uh, the same name with return string, right? But I don't know what exception handling, what structs, what everything, how it will be converted. So I would have to analyze it and kind of understand it. So the first problem is kind of a docs, right? I don't have docs in this layer. I have all the docs here. The second problem is um, if you're using the library from Go, it is designed for Go, right? So it is kind of designed to be inter interface and built from Go, not from Java. So some of the constructs, some of the logic, some of the things are kind of Go specific. So um, they, they will be kind of uh, incompatible elements, right? So you have, um, yeah, how, how we kind of specify it. Let's say it's uh, interop, interop. So interop is a little bit of an issue because first of all, it's out of your control. And second of all, not everything will automatically work, right? Uh, so what happens is, um, and the third thing is, you may not need all this API. You may only need like three methods, right? If I only use three methods out of this, uh, why do I compile everything and expose everything, right? Uh, so scope. So then there is a scope. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes some libraries expose everything from the native layer to the kind of a Java layer. OpenCV does that. But OpenCV doesn't do that through the automated tool chain. There is a human involved in doing that layer, right? So the human kind of translates everything and all the edge cases to actually work and interop nicely in that um, target language. So. What you want is, you don't want to take everything into Java. You want to say, I want to take some parts, so subset, right? Uh, also, you may want to put some logic uh, and some of the behavior, not, from, not be expressed in Java, but kind of do them here, right? So you end up kind of writing a little bit of a glue code which kind of exposes some of the things to your, to your Java code uh, for various reasons, right? So for various reasons, you kind of need to fiddle with this middle layer a little bit uh, yourself, right? So this first attempt of kind of having the intermediate, um, intermediate layer kind of done, and, you know, totally automatically is not kind of a good solution. You want to have kind of a human in the loop to specify what that is, right? So to demonstrate why the first part wouldn't work, I kind of uh, have, um, uh, so I compiled it, and I pre-prepared a kind of a simple edge case um, where I have, um, so let me delete that. So I have a very simple uh, public method so I'm kind of importing the library in Go. I have a simple uh, method, public method, which returns a peer ID. A peer ID is a ID of the peer. It's a struct which uh, the library generates when I instantiate a host, right? And then I have, I have a, a small uh, setup code which um, sets up the library and instantiate a node in this peer-to-peer -peer network and gives it an ID, right? So then I have the host, which is the kind of a new um, host for the node that I've instantiated. And then I'm returning the peer ID of that host, right? Uh, simple? Simple, straightforward, right? What I did, I kind of uh, generated this, I compiled it, and I ended up with... Um, now we have to go to the work... Uh, 
sources uh, marriage local p2p test and I have I have this code here and I've generated all the uh, all the necessary things and one of the things that it generated is this uh, p2p test package which I same as we had before right um, so I have this p2p p2p uh, package and if you look inside you will see that um, my public function setup host has been skipped by the mechanisms because it has an unsupported parameter or return type. Well, what my setup host function does? Let's have a look again. It doesn't have any parameter, which means it has to be supported. It returns the struct, right? So struct is not supported. Um, almost everything in Go is structs, right? plus primitive types. Um, so now we have the puzzle. Like we have, um, I can return a string, I can return a float, I can return an integer, I can return a bool, but I cannot return a struct, right? That's a major blow because most of the API, most of the public API from the native layer will be those primitive types plus structs, which I pass around. So I, if I generate all the public API for myself, I will end up not being able to use it because most of it is not supported, right? Um, so um, that kind of leads us to um, the project which I mentioned earlier, that not being able to support structs as a class in Java is a major problem, but it shouldn't be too hard. You know, structs are um, structs. They kind of have data fields, which are either nested or primitive type. Uh, primitive types are supported, so passing data as a struct from Go layer to Java layer shouldn't be much of a challenge. It, it should be just doable. Um, so extending the Go mobile project by supporting structs would open up a lot of opportunities for automated generated, automatically generated APIs, right? Currently, what I have to do is I have to translate everything to some of the primitive types and uh, see if I can um, use them, right? So let's um, do another test. I will, um, I will create um, a use case where I'm uh, generating a, a hash map. So I have a map which maps strings to strings. Um, and then I will kind of um, so yeah, I will do this and I will say return nil yeah, just for compiling sake. I, I don't really actually need to uh, return anything. And I will try go mobile. And this one was called P2P test. Yeah, so we, we have to wait and that takes a while um, because it actually has to build all the libraries which I'm using plus my code, right? Uh, so I, I'm just want to check if if maps are supported. In any case, what I did is uh, I compiled it into um, into those uh, two files, AAR and JAR, as before. Uh, I have in the JAR file I have this interface to Java, and in the um, Android Studio. We can reuse the same um, the same project. I just delete this. So I delete this and I will um, delete this. And then in the project structure, we remove the two dependencies. So we get rid of this. Um, yeah, that's not that easy. So we just remove that from the dependencies. So this one. We don't need that one, and we don't need this one. Uh, we add two new ones. So, oh uh, yeah, I have to add the module first. So new module. Marius.
go go work source merge local p2p test and the jar file yep project structure dependencies and I remove those two and this one okay so now if I go here and say import p to p test yeah it will eventually work um, but uh, so it didn't compile correctly um, oh yeah so I have to say uh, export modules of so Go uses modules and uses a uh, uh, Go get dependency tracker. Uh, Go mobile is not supporting the new modules yet. You have to use the old system for dependencies. And if you're using the new system, it gets kind of uh, confused. So you have to set the Go 11 modules off. Um, so there are little things like this, which kind of uh, take you hours to work out <laughs> sometimes. Uh, I actually spent yeah, almost three hours fighting the Go Mobile before I I've realized that I have to have this um, environmental variable to set, set off. All right, so it compiled, um, and now if we have a look into our P2P test and see the API that we got, um, you will see that setup host doesn't support maps neither, right? And maps are super easy uh, to be supported, right? So if I don't have maps and I don't have structs, I cannot pass from Go into my Java any, any, any complex structure data, right? So it really limits me to what I can do, right? And it kind of makes me uh, unable to express all the logic in the Java, I have to express all the logic in Go, and then only interface very simple things like strings and numbers back to the, under, to the uh, target language, right? So as you see, I am kind of exposing a public method which returns a map and I cannot do that, right? So the Go mobile uh, package generator and this limitation is not inherent in the JNI or in the way you map from Go to Java. It's just inherent in the limitations of the currently supported facilities of Go Mobile, right? So in theory, I could now only, what I could do is, I can go to my uh, source, I can do what I need to do, create some public methods which I will call from Java, but do most of the logic and most of the things from Go, right? Because otherwise it's very complicated for me to pass data structures into Java and express the logic in Java. Uh, what if you convert it into JSON sent as a string to convert it? To exactly, you, exactly. So I would have to do that, right? I would have to convert everything to primitive types and kind of uh, use JSON, for example, as a structured data container. But you could imagine that being extremely inefficient because if I have a struct here and a class here, a cl uh, instance object, and I ha always have to change it to JSON back and forth when I'm talking from Java to my Go and from Go to Java, that's crap, right? Sure, I can do that. If I'm doing it infrequently, if I just want to show something to a user, user picks something and off it goes to go and, and so on, I, I could use that. I could use uh, JSON to pass data back and forth. Um, so uh, the point here is that um, compiling even very complex, um, and, and this one is almost 5 meg, right? This AAR, AAR file. 
it basically is compiling entire um, lib2p2 uh, library into an ARM uh, machine code that I can use it from Go. Um, most of it, it's, it's kind of compiled in. Uh, the problem is not with this, that methods are not here and structs are not here. Everything is fine. The problem is with this, that for some things I am unable to access it because this marshalling and unmarshalling mechanisms are not implemented, right? So in the worst case, I could just have a layer which does JSON to JSON conversion and pass data back and forth between Java and, um, and Go. Um, so if I go back here and try, yeah, I have to do one more thing. So I have to new, new module again, include this and include the AAR file. Uh, not from here. It's from Go source. Uh, Marius Loco P2P test AR. Yeah, and in the project, project structure, come on. Project structure dependencies plus module p2p test so now if i do um rebuild yeah so it android studio has to update all the in indices and everything and it already updated that our p2p test is visible but my method setup host um so if I do p to p test and want to call setup, it, it, it's not there, right? Um, so what I would have to do is I would have to change my return type to something that it understands. Um, so I could achieve this. I could achieve my um, installation of the node using p2p library, but I have to return something that it understands. So I can do this by, for example, calling... Uh, pretty, which I uh, looked up just a moment ago. Um, so if you go here, I was looking it up because I wanted to find how can I convert the peer ID into the, whoops, uh, into a string. And there are a couple of methods. So one is called pretty, which, conf which pretty prints uh, B, 58 encoded string. Um, so it, it can take the identifier and encodes it into a B58 encoding. What is a B58 compared to B64? 58 bytes instead of 64? No, it's not about bytes. It's about uh, characters used. So um, the binary 64 encoding we use for binary data that we have to encode as strings, an email, for example, or email attachments are not en you know, embedded in as binaries. They're embedded in as base 64 encoded strings because the SMTP doesn't have anything but string. You cannot deal on mail layer with anything but string, right? So all the Im image, um, that's why uh, if you have a binary image and you attach it to an email, it blows up because it cannot be sent as a binary blob. It has to be sent as a base64 encoded text, right? And you have 64 characters which are used to express the text. So it's lower and uppercase uh, letters, digits, and some uh, extra symbols, right? And it ends up with 64 alphabet to express uh, the binary data. But base 58 is using only 58 characters instead of 64, right? Uh, so if you say base 58, um, it says it's the binary to text encoding, uh, which is uh, used to differentiate uh, some of the characters which are confusing to people. So for example, zero and capital O uh, capital I and lower L 
some uh, like a one and L, um, so that excludes like one uh, lower O um, and so on. So there is a base 66, 56 encoding, which also removes the one and lower case O. Um, so it's to make it when you are reading something to make no typos because you misread, uh, you know, capital uh, O with zero, for example, right? Yeah, anyway, so I can call this method. So if I change my code to uh, use this method and return string and I save it uh, and I uh, rerun the go mobile uh, and then rerun the project, I will be able to call this method and have a string as a return. And I actually instantiate an, a fully functioning node uh, for the peer-to-peer -peer messaging in my Android, right? I did it from Java, but as you've seen, uh, there is a lot of problems with making it really usable. Uh, and one of the projects which we were thinking of with Chris is to provide um, maps for the, uh, for the layer uh, above. Um, yes, I have, uh, so let me just say, go build. I have an error. Uh, what it complains about? So pretty should return a string. Yeah, anyway, it, it that kind of doesn't matter. You got the, the idea. Line so, so, sorry? Line 25. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, all right. That's right, because it's already a string. Yeah, good catch. I already changed the code, so I can rebuild it. Yeah, so once this finishes successfully, then I can, uh, I can call setup post here and the method will be uh, visible um, when the new jar file is regenerated here. Um, so the idea is to kind of uh, go a little bit into the Go Mobile and change it such that it allows you to generate structs or generate uh, maps for the, from Go to Java and back, right? Uh, one could use just the normal hash map from Java to translate maps and maps in Go usually use primitive types, so it shouldn't be any problem. It would be nice if the conversion also supports structs, but with structs it's a little bit more complicated because um, you have just fields, you have kind of data fields and structs, but you also have methods, right? So sometimes you, have, you can have a method which operates on a struct. Um, just doing the data conversion itself would be enough, but uh, having the method converted to class with uh, attributes and method, that would be much nicer. So that, we thought that would be a kind of a very nice engineering uh, bachelor project to enhance the, the project, then you can make yourself a, a bit of a name because uh, it is, you know, the Go Mobile is associated with Google and it is a, a tool chain which is used for generating Android applications from Go sources. So uh, I don't think it's super hard, but I don't think they have resources and, and time to, to do that. Uh, so it would be a nice uh, bachelor project and it will also be a nice uh, summer of code project. I don't know whether you know about summer of code. It's the Google every summer advertises our projects which are funded um, and they pay developers to develop some open source code uh, for like two or three months. And that would definitely qualify. They would be interested in having that done as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the end of my pitch. Um, it's still compiling. Oh yes, it finished. So let's see if this works. So, any questions? Yeah, it doesn't. 
but probably I probably need to uh, refresh the the project to see that I've changed the source files there. I'll rerun it. All right. So thank you very much. I can't review an assignment. Uh, obviously, it's because it's in private mode. What to do with that? Chris, uh, Repo is in a private mode. He can't review the assignment. Uh, yeah, that's not good. Um, can you send me? Uh, yeah, I can give you the link of the person, uh, the repo link. Okay. Uh, then I will uh, post it on Git Discord and say the person should make it public so they don't know it's you that was reviewing it. Yeah. They think I am. Because uh, that's what I did for a few people already. Uh, so okay. just send me per email or whatever or per direct message in Discord. Just the link. And say, hey, that guy. The link to the back. repo. Yeah. Okay. You know, you have that link that you're supposed yes. to review. Yeah. Just send that to me and I'll, I'll send to Discord and say, please make it public and then you need to check and follow up. If he doesn't make it public, bad luck, no marks. Oh, right? I mean, that's our expectation. Yeah, Professionalism. Yeah. yeah. I also have an issue. Some of uh, one of my reviewers yeah. have messed my lab one uh, review with someone else's. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. That should be. <laughs> he has uh, written this to me because uh, a comment. He said that I reviewed your lab one, but I missed the. Uh, I messed them uh, the reviews. Right. Okay. Where do you this? Uh, we will have a session where we fix all that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we will bring it all together though, so we can exclude reviews, review yeah. reviews, and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, so don't worry about it. We we'll bring it up. It's all a, a bit of a trial process anyway. So don't be worried about losing your, your points because of that. Because in the end, we are still doing the marketing because uh, you can just help us evaluate. But fundamentally, it's our role to do it. So, uh, but um, just be here when the time comes because then I will, you know, we'll have a session and bringing also the developers so you can see those guys as well. Uh, so an opportunity for feedback, but also to fix all the apps. So, uh, yes. Probably sometime next week is probably sensible. So yeah, we'll fit that in there. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Are you still uh, doing stuff? I want to make sure that it actually works. Yeah, Which it should. It's radial. I know. Yeah, it usually works, but it's just a matter of uh, patience. Being really patient. Bad luck. That's incredibly sad. Uh, I don't know why. Um, cannot find symbol method setup. All oh, right, Java can't find it. Right. So the pre-compilation didn't work. But the order of uh, compilation is correct, right? Yeah, the order is correct. I just regenerated the file, and I think it caches the. Ah, oh, you did the build successful. Now it's successful. No, it was a clean successful. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Android Studio caches the the jar file and the AAR, so you have to re-import it every time you actually change it. Yeah. Yeah. Probably didn't test it properly, I guess. I mean, um, is, is that an edge case for usage anyway, right? So I mean, yeah, not many exactly. people do that, right? Yeah. So, it's probably so that's like concurrent development on both Android side and uh, yeah. Okay. Is it Are you good with CMake? No, I don't know CMake. What is CMake? It's uh, the devil's work. Is it? It's proof that. Uh, no. And it can't find to the other files. I can just. Um, Try most of the things I find in Stack Overflow. Because the first thing is like, if you can't find this DLL, and the first thing they tell you is like, okay, you should probably add it next to the uh, executable. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, yeah, so I did that. And that didn't work. And I also checked my System32 folder, yeah. and, and it has the DLLs. And I also download, like, I tried downloading the 32 bit and the so maybe what's the specific on the 
So if you have any copies into the um, um, bin directory that has the executable, what happens? Uh, nothing. So I, I still get the same. I don't know, maybe. Um, So uh, hang on, check the executable again, just run again, and see which path it actually gives us. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think it's like, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's the number of the, uh, yeah, yeah, then the path, uh, so it is, that the master of bin source files, source files, and GTF files. So let's navigate to it directly, and just go and close that thing. Uh, bin source file, yeah, yeah, I want to put it on, yeah. So let's do it. Um, so as far as that's exactly what we can do. And let's put in this uh, CP. Well, I will see you this. Uh, I'm not sure. I think I'll implement that this thing. Okay, um, my other suggestion, uh, which I have yeah, a space in the name. Uh, oh, the uh, yeah, program. Not there, but in the uh, program, yeah. Oh, there, yeah. um, that can be also part. Okay, so we do it. But we do. Yeah, I can, I can just read it. Yeah, exactly. If you rename that and report your stuff, uh, there's a stick it up. There's actually a few stick with the file reset one. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's just the first. Yeah, it's just the first. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Space is on. Uh, uh, I have it open. So even though it's not explicitly open, it still often retains references yeah. to those files. Windows is not as nice as uh, uh, Linux. Never mind, mind. I have it. I didn't realize. Um, oh, really? Sorry, I kind of did. I just almost fell asleep. So literally, we're not going to be doing it. So are you commenting about Linux again? <laughs> <laughs> I answered your question on this one. Right? That's how I think we can make the man by the setup. The more my right. Yes, it works. Yeah, I have to reimport the modules afresh. Oh, so you probably better save off scripting this uh, yeah. process than it That's right. Be That's right. But once you have it synced, then it works and it kind of uh, instantiates the the node. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah.